everyone. This is Dean Wampler from AnyScale, and I'm going to do a talk about scaling Python applications from a laptop to a cluster. Um, there's a bunch of links here. You can contact me at dean at anyscale.com uh, or on Twitter at Dean Wampler. Uh, you can find out more about Ray at ray.io, anyscale at anyscale.com. We do have some online events happening this summer, and you can go to anyscale.com slash events to find out more about those. And I'll make these slides available after the talk. Uh, the motivation for Ray is really reflecting a couple of trends in our industry. So th this is a graph on the left of the sizes of neural networks as they've evolved over the last you know, five or six years. And basically, they've been evolving a, you know, a factor of like 35 times every 18 months. You know, by comparison, Moore's law is every two months. So you know, just scaling hardware alone is not doing it for us. We need uh, distributed computing to, to keep up with the demand. At the same time, Python is continuing to grow strongly as a language driven in a large uh, degree by uh, interest in ML, AI, and other data science workloads. And so together, these two trends are really uh, creating a pressing need for us to make it easy to distribute Python applications over a cluster to, to meet these demands for scalability, but also to be accessible and easy to use by Python developers. So if you look at the ML landscape today, you know, there's a bunch of sort of tasks that you have to do. A featureization is like figuring out what aspects of your data are most useful for doing predictions or whatever. Uh, we often process data in real time with streams. I'll talk about hyperparameter tuning and why that's important a little bit later. Um, you know, hyperparameter tuning is about picking the best model structure. And once we have that, then we have to train our models. Uh, when you're doing reinforcement learning, you're often running like game simulators or other kinds of simulators. Um, and then once you've got these models trained after all of that work, then you have to serve them. And pretty much all of these things really require uh, distributed implementations to scale uh, effectively, especially as you get in the middle of this diagram. So the vision of Ray is to create a, a core framework that can meet all the requirements for these different kinds of compute loads, uh, different situations, different deployment models, etc. Uh, targeted originally to, towards Python, but it's actually flexible enough to support other languages. For example, there's a, a sort of an alpha quality Java implementation that, or API that's being developed. And then on top of that, we'd like to have domain specific libraries. So you may not even ever know you're using Ray if you're working in hyperparameter tuning or reinforcement learning. You'll just use these libraries that exist for the purpose. But if you're you know, writing general purpose applications, then you might really want to know about Ray. <clears throat> so let's see how, how, what it's like to actually use Ray. It's designed to be as intuitive and concise as possible and to leverage familiar ideas. So one of them, of course, is writing functions in uh, Python. Uh, this is you know, sort of a mocked up example where we have some function make array that returns a NumPy array, and then some function add arrays that can add two arrays together. So you're, this is very familiar. If you know Python, this should not be uh, hard to figure out. Well, if you want to turn these into distributed tasks, which is the term we use, all you have to do is annotate these functions with Ray Remote, and then they become uh, possible to execute across a cluster automatically by Ray. And for completeness, uh, for, if this code were to work, you'd have to do a few imports and then initialize Ray in your application. So another difference is you now invoke these by appending a dot .remote function uh, to make array to call them. Now, if Python's malleable enough that we you know, could have made it possible to just say make array with an argument list, but the reason we keep the remote in here is so that it's easy reading the code to know exactly what's going on. So it does require a little more code change, but it's, you know, as they say, you tend to read code more often than write it, so we felt it was better to have dot remote here as an indicator about what is actually Ray specific versus what's general Python. But what's actually happening here is that you're sending an asynchronous computation to be done, this task, and it immediately returns an ID that actually corresponds to a future that we can use later to retrieve the, the result of this computation. And that's what ID one is. We can do this again, and then we could call uh, this remote function to actually add the results when we're done. And then uh, we use this function ray.get to actually retrieve the value from um, uh, this computation. In this case, we only care about ID3. We don't have to fetch the other two, although we could. Um, 
this is a blocking call. It will uh, you know, uh, block until ID3 is available, and then it will return the object that ID3 points to, in this case, a NumPy array. Now, one of the cool things is that Ray is handling the sequencing of these dependencies. It cannot run add arrays until the two make array calls have completed. And it just does that automatically for us. We don't have to put in logic to wait and you know check to see that they're done and then uh, handle it that way. It just does it for us. So it knows about this graph on the right and it processes it uh, automatically. The other nice thing is that uh, since add arrays is remote, we didn't have to extract the arrays from these future handles in order to pass them to add arrays. Ray does this automatically for us behind the scenes. So it sort of looks like the way we would have written regular Python code we don't even really have to know necessarily that these are IDs to some future as opposed to actual arrays. Although, of course, you kind of do need to know that at some point, especially in the last line. <clears throat> so what about distributed state? Excuse me. <coughs> so it's, it's pretty common uh, when you're uh, writing a distributed application that you run into this problem of how do I manage the state that's now getting distributed over the cluster? And for that, we're leveraging a familiar concept in Python called classes, which is hopefully familiar to everybody. In this case, I have a simple counter class that keeps track of a value, and every time I call increment, it increments the value by one, and then returns the current value. Well, once again, you annotate it with Ray Remote. Now it becomes an actor. Now, why the term actor? Well, this is a, a kind of an old idea. The, the actor model is over 45 years old, uh, and it was made famous in commercial implementations by the Erlang language. Uh, in the JVM world, there's ACA and there's other uh, implementations. It's the idea that you have these autonomous agents and you communicate with them by sending them messages, either to do work or to get values or whatever. And then the environment provides a thread safe execution model. One at a time, those messages are processed, so they're kept in a queue somewhere. Uh, and that means that the writer of an actor implementation doesn't have to worry about thread safety code. They just write regular code and uh, the actor model handles the uh, thread safety for you. So it's a really powerful model for concurrency. It, it abstracts over a lot of the complexity of writing thread safe code. So now we have a remote actor. Um, now there is one difference you have to do here. Uh, Ray currently doesn't support just reading the values of fields inside the uh, object. So you do have to write a getter method if uh, it's not sufficient to just capture the value of increment. <coughs> okay, so what actually happens, once again, we use our remote calls. Um, notice how it's used for both the constructor and for these method calls. And then uh, we can also call Ray.get with an array of IDs and that's gonna return an array of, uh, or a list of one and two. Um, this ray.remote uh, function actually does take a, a bunch of uh, optional parameters that, to specify things like how many GPUs you wanna use and how many times you can call this function before not allowing any more calls and that kind of stuff. Okay, so how does this work? <coughs> so here, imagine I've got a three node cluster. Um, We'll talk about what all of these uh, boxes are doing in a moment, but basically we're going to see how this uh, graph of uh, tasks could be scheduled in a cluster like this. So let's assume that our driver program is running on node one. As soon as we make these uh, function calls, it's going to schedule or call the local scheduler to do the uh, uh, computation. Now it's going to return those IDs immediately. You know, these are asynchronous computations, so the uh, calling them uh, comes back right away. And we also have this global control store that's keeping track of where, where everything is and what's going on. So the scheduler might pick the local worker uh, to do the first make array call. And it might pick another worker on another node to do the other one. And once each uh, task is finished, it will write its uh, result, its object, back to the object store. And now these tasks can be deleted from the worker memory. This is one difference with, with actors, actually. Actors are pinned to the worker because they're holding state, and until references to them disappear in the driver code, they'll remain in the worker. <clears throat> Now we can schedule our add arrays. 
It can read object one from shared memory. It doesn't need to copy the object out of the store into the worker's memory space. So this is rather convenient. If, if object one is very big, it helps for performance. Now object two is not on the same node, so this has to be copied over. There's a bit of overhead obviously doing this, but now it can be read from shared memory too. And when uh, add arrays is done, it writes its result back to the object store. And then when we call ray.get, the global control store tells us where it is, and our code returns object 3. And that's it. So it's uh, you know doing a lot of work behind the scenes for you. There's obviously a little bit of overhead for all this stuff, so you don't want to use really fine-grained tasks because you'll incur overhead that's you know just not uh, giving you that much value. But it is fantastic for doing all this asynchronous work, even very large computations with large objects over a distributed cluster. All right, suppose you want to get involved with Ray. What are some of the uh, things you might want to look into? Uh, the first place to start is Ray.io. That's where you'll find our blog, um, uh, links to the documentation, and so forth. Um, the, then the next link here is actually the documentation, where you can find uh, uh, details about installing Ray, getting started, and so forth. We're developing uh, new tutorials um, in our so-called AnyScale Academy. Those will be coming out this summer. Uh, actually, this spring and summer. If you want to see the GitHub code for the Ray project, here's the link for that. If you need help, the best place to go is the Ray Slack. We monitor it really carefully and uh, often help people there. There's also a Ray Dev uh, group if you prefer doing uh, conversation over emails. All right, suppose you want to uh, adopt Ray. Uh, you could certainly start programming Ray directly, but you may have already been writing code using other APIs. Well, it turns out we've done implementations of the APIs for async.io, joblib, and multiprocessing.pool so that um, you can just drop in, uh, in most cases, just drop in Ray by changing an import statement. Uh, and then you not only have the same uh, you know, local mode or local node uh, com computation, but now you've broken that boundary. You can, you can basically scale your apps to a cluster just with this substitution. And there's a couple of blog links on our uh, Ray blog. Uh, you, if you go to Ray.io, you can get to these uh, blog posts and find out more information about uh, how this is done. All right, let's talk about these higher level libraries that I mentioned uh, towards the beginning for machine learning. And I'll just talk about two of them today. You know, once again, there's several here. Tune is for hyperparameter tuning. Ray SGD is something we just rolled out that uh, helps distribute training. Uh, RLlib is uh, perhaps our most popular library for reinforcement learning. And then another new library is SIR for model serving. So let's talk about RLlib for a minute. So if you don't know much about reinforcement learning, the, the idea is pretty simple, although obviously there's a lot of complexity behind the scenes. You have some sort of agent acting in an environment, uh, and it's observing what's going on. Uh, it's it's also making decisions about what actions to do next, and then it observes what reward it receives for taking that, those actions. And the goal is to optimize the rewards uh, during the sequence of steps that it takes in this environment. And some famous examples are the AlphaGo system that beat the world's best Go player. That was really one of the things that put it, uh, reinforcement learning on the map in a very big way. Uh, it's been used to play the Atari games, uh, to train uh, simulated robots, um, and even uh, like simulated walkers, teaching them to walk. You know, AlphaGo is a little bit more sophisticated, or very sophisticated as you might imagine. There's a big neural network behind the scenes that's helping make decisions. Uh, so in this case, the observations are the board state, the actions are where to place the stones, and the uh, neural network is you know, trying to give you the best choices there. And the rewards are pretty simple, either you win or you don't. We're also seeing it, uh, uh, reinforcement learning being used in a bunch of other contexts. There's um, a lot of interesting work being done on optimizing industrial processes, like how factory floors work and uh, pipelines and so forth, um, optimizing network computing and that sort of thing. It's being used as a, a new way to do uh, ad serving and recommendations that get, get around some of the problems of scale with traditional methods. And finance too, you know, obviously the stock market is a, you know, a time bearing system. And uh, so in theory, you should be able to use reinforcement learning to optimize your performance in the stock market. So whatever application you're building, 
there's a whole bunch of architectural decisions you'll make, like whether there's a single agent or multiple cooperating agents or a hierarchy of them. Offline batch is kind of interesting. It's about the idea that, well, I can't have you just run my chemical factory over and over again, but I do have massive logs of past performance. Can we train against that? Uh, RLLib tries to provide a uniform API for all of these choices and then give you a, a wide range of the algorithms that have been developed for reinforcement learning, all executed by Ray. <clears throat> uh, here's an eye chart of many of the algorithms that are available in RLLib. These are all links that uh, you can uh, click to if, when you get the PDF for this uh, talk. You can even uh, run it in SageMaker if you're an Amazon customer. Now, in fact, reinforcement learning was one of the big motivators for the creation of Ray because there's a whole lot of different compute and memory access patterns involved in, in reinforcement learning. You may be running a simulator, like a game engine, a robot sim, factory four simulator, whatever. And this is more like a typical uh, object-oriented application or whatever that has very diverse complex graphs and memory, diverse access patterns for those graphs, different computations, and so forth. Um, and it's not your traditional data processing problem where you just have massive data sets that you're flowing through a, a system to do queries or transformations or whatever. Very different kind of compute model. You're also doing all the regular neural network stuff that we've uh, been uh, optimizing with systems like TensorFlow and PyTorch. And you're going to have to run this over and over again because you're going to keep playing the, the game, if you will, until uh, you find an optimal configuration that maximizes the reward. So you need to be able to do this efficiently and so forth. So there's just a, a diverse a set of challenges here that none of the existing systems that the researchers at Berkeley were dealing with could really address. So they invented Ray. Let's talk about hyperparameter tuning and the tune library for, for doing this. So hyperparameter tuning is really asking what's the best model type that I should use where the hyperparameters tell you that. So the most trivial example I could come up with is the K, and K means clustering. Uh, this is an example of K equals 3, where uh, you know once I picked K, then I'll iterate through with a relatively straightforward algorithm to find the clusters in my data set. As you, you know, look at this um, uh, moving example on the right, you can see that there's two fairly obvious clusters and then one more amorphous cluster. So k equals 3 is about right. If you're working with two-dimensional data, you can plot it often and just look at it and see what the best choice is, but it's not so easy if you're doing multi-dimensional data beyond three dimensions um, and maybe very complex structure. So uh, sometimes you just have to run this uh, clustering algorithms many times with different values of k to find the best k value. And that's really what hyperparameter tuning is about, finding that structure and then training the model to give you the actual parameters, which would be the clusters in this case. Well, you know, finding uh, the K and K means is not a terribly challenging problem. It's a little bit expensive maybe doing the computation, but where it really gets challenging is when you're looking at things like neural networks. Every single number you see here, including the number of layers, what kinds of layers is a hyperparameter. And there's obviously a huge, huge uh, space of choices you could make when you're trying to pick the best neural network for a problem. So the, the idea with hyperparameter tuning is to optimize that search process so that you come up with the best network or, or a reasonably good performing network without you know, wasting uh, an extreme amount of uh, compute trying to find it. It does matter. You know, this is an example of you know, running a, a cheetah simulator with different sets of hyperparameters, and the blue does the best job, uh, the pink does the worst job in this case. So it does make a difference. And Tune emerged as a tool for helping you find the best model. Uh, when resources are expensive, like GPUs, for example, for neural network training, uh, and it's also time consuming to do training, and you want to optimize all of these things. So Tune handles the uh, distributed training as you try a lot of different model structures to see which one is best. You know, it leverages a bunch of um, uh, algorithms behind the scenes and, and tools like PyTorch, TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, and so forth. Uh, and it tries to make it very easy to just declare what you want to do uh, and then do it. And then Tune does the rest of the work. It's integrated with TensorBoard so you can see what your hyperparameters look like. 
And it's built with deep learning as a priority, as we mentioned, that's where this is really a problem. You know, so it has resource aware scheduling, you know, you can tell it where the GPUs are. <coughs> uh, it does, you know, pretty seamless distributed execution. You don't really have to know what's going on behind the scenes. You just know there's a cluster out there doing your work. It's relatively uh, simple to add new algorithms uh, and new tools to the API. So it's like an umbrella for these things. And it's framework agnostic. It supports a bunch of the popular frameworks. And here's the link for the Tune documentation, again, at the Ray Read the Docs.io site. Last thing I want to talk about is uh, let's put aside machine learning for a minute and talk about Ray as a general tool for microservices, whatever kind of services you're building. Now, I know microservices are getting a little bit of blowback at the moment. You may have heard uh, Uber famously saying that they're going to macro services. Uh, you know, aside from the point of what's the right sizing for your services, the general idea is, is still valid. You just have to be smart about how you use it. Um, there's sort of a couple of reasons why you build uh, microservices, just to stick with the term. One is that they partition the domain, and this is often uh, partitioned in two ways. One is embracing Conway's law, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. The other is just to separate responsibilities, like have the network team worry about DNS uh, resolution, uh, the security team to worry about authentication, that kind of stuff. And also uh, management of these things in production is an important driver. So Conway's law, this was an observation by Mel Conway uh, back in the 60s that he noticed that the architecture of systems often reflected the organization of the structure that built them. In other words, like the subsystems tended to reflect teams or sub organizations within the larger team. Um, and it's something we've actually decided we should embrace. We should organize our teams to reflect the structure of the system we're building. And that, and the reason for doing this, or the reason that uh, this happened in the beginning, was that we want to minimize the communication we have to do outside of our organization because that's a burden for, for people to have too many uh, communication channels to maintain. Uh, and it lets us encapsulate you know, within a, a smaller team the, the amount of uh, high fidelity communication that's required. Obviously, I just mentioned a few examples of where you want your microservice to have you know, minimal, uh, like hopefully a single responsibility that it does very well and it has a natural minimal coupling to other microservices and hopefully reflects the team organization as well. But the thing I'm really uh, heading towards here as far as Ray is the, the management challenge. Um, it's common in a DevOps world for the development team to also be responsible for running and operationalizing their microservices, you know, in some framework that was built by the, the, the organization as a whole. And what you typically see is that um, each microservice will actually have a different number of instances from the other microservice, and those instances will come and go at different rates. If um, you know, as I've shown on this diagram, microservice three might not need as many instances, but suppose it's actually evolving much faster and has to be updated more frequently. Well, you know, the other two might be more stable, but require more instances for their load. This is a bit of a burden. And, you know, why do we have so many instances here? Well, there's two reasons. One is we need, um, uh, we might need them for scalability because, uh, you know, we hit the limits of one node, so we have to go to more nodes and, and, and hence more instances. Uh, and also it helps with resiliency. If we have uh, you know, a crucial microservice uh, and it's running just on one node and that node crashes, well, we could be in trouble. So resiliency is another reason. What Ray is giving us is the ability, you know, this is sort of a 90-10 kind of solution. It's, I don't want to pretend this is magic, but because Ray can transparently leverage a whole cluster behind the scenes, it goes back to the idea that we really have one logical instance for each microservice we're running, and we let Ray handle the scalability behind us. And this also uh, dovetails nicely with uh, clustering systems like Kubernetes. You know, if you think about a pod of containers in Kubernetes, it's really like a small machine. And just as Ray can use, you know, uh, physical hardware, it's a much more fine-grained scheduling system that can work inside the, the constructs of a larger scheduling system like uh, Kubernetes. So to conclude, Ray is the new state-of-the-art uh, system for distributed computing. Um, it's, uh, you know, we believe the shortest path to go from something that's running on your laptop to something that's running in the cloud on a cluster of machines or in you know, native hardware on, in your environment 
uh, and it's ability, it, it has enough flexibility that it can run a wide diversity of, um, of compute tasks and memory access patterns. AnyScale was the company that spun out of Berkeley to uh, develop Ray as an open source system and to build products and services around it. We are actually hiring even in this uh, COVID era we live in. And you can find out more at uh, anyscale.com. Uh, I can't actually take questions, unfortunately, but here's some more links for you. Uh, again, Ray.io is the place to go for information about Ray. Anyscale.com, find out about you know, our uh, job openings. Find out about the events like our summer Ray Summit Connect series. These are online events we're doing uh, starting in May. Um, we are going to do Race Summit. That was scheduled for May. It's now going, most likely going to happen in November. And I, I do welcome you to reach out to me at uh, any scale, uh, dean at anyscale.com, uh, especially if you want the slides. Uh, I'll try to make them available, but I'm not sure where they'll uh, be posted yet. So feel free to reach out to me at dean at anyscale.com. Thank you so much, and I hope you enjoyed this talk.